this week is all about hierarchical Bayesian models. They're quite complicated. We're barely going to scratch the surface. And notwithstanding the fact that our treatment is going to be fairly superficial, we can discern some general features of hierarchical Bayesian models, and that's what this video is all about. So what are some of these features? Well, the first is that what hierarchical Bayesian models allow us to do is to take complicated systems and break them out into bite-sized submodels that have meaning. And these submodels arise through a process of factorization. They result in a hierarchy. So these submodels are arranged in a hierarchy, and they are also conditionally independent. And a second feature of hierarchical Bayesian models is that they allow us to see multiple sources of variation. And these sources of variation are further partitioned into phenomena, which in this case will be, since we're dealing with birds, biological and data processes. And this video focuses on these two features. A third important feature of hierarchical models, regardless of whether they're Bayesian or frequentist, is that they involve two linked phenomena, pooling and shrinkage. They'll be dealt with in the next video. So, beginning with this idea that we've got meaningful submodels that are arranged in a hierarchy and are conditionally independent. So let's start with this notion of meaningful submodels. So we've got four of these meaningful submodels, and we'll start at the bottom with the first one that says that the number of observed offspring arise as random draws from Poisson distributions with this parameter here, which is the bird-specific fecundity. And the second submodel, what we're saying is that the bird-specific fecundity arises from a gamma distribution, which has as its mean this thing. And that thing has two components. This part here, that reflects the fact that fecundity declines with number of years since the bird began reproducing. And this component here, which is the maximum fecundity of the bird that begins as soon as it begins to reproduce. And this maximum fecundity arises from this third submodel, which is a gamma distribution, which has this as its mean, which in turn has two components. This part that says that the maximum fecundity declines with the territory size of the bird. And this part here that says that the maximum fecundity depends on the habitat type, whether it's forested, shrub, or grassland. And then we've got a fourth submodel that says that the territory size of any individual bird cannot be known exactly. But what we have are three replicate observations, and these three replicate observations are deemed to arise from a gamma distribution, which has as its mean the true territory size of that bird. So, a complicated system is partitioned into meaningful submodels. And that's done through the process of factorization. So what I'm going to do is go over what we saw before, which is the factorization for the first model. So we begin with Bayes' theorem. It says that the posterior distribution of our seven parameters, so we've got five values of fecundity, the species-specific mean fecundity, and we've got this variance that reflects the fact that there are other factors besides species-specific fecundity that determine bird-specific fecundity. So we have the posterior of these parameters conditional upon the data is proportional to the data conditional upon the parameters multiplied by the prior probability of the parameters. We went through factorization and we said we could wind up with a data process here. The conditional probability of the observations conditional upon the bird specific fecundity times the phenomena, in this case the biological process that relates to the conditional probability of the fecundity given the species specific fecundity and again this variance that captures other factors besides species 
specific fecundity to determine birth specific fecundity and then finally our priors so that's factorization for model one how about our th model three well for model three it's really complicated so if you're interested it's presented in the supplementary materials I'm not going to go over that now the notion that these sub models are arranged in a hierarchy is very important so first the individual observations of number of birds arise from a distribution that has as its parameter the fecundity of that bird the fecundity of that bird in turn arises from a distribution which has as its mean something that's determined by the maximum fecundity of the bird and the bird's age and then the maximum fecundity of the bird in turn is derived from another gamma distribution that has this as its mean so you can see that there is a hierarchy there's also a hierarchy or hierarchical component obvious here in that these observed values of territory size arise as a random draw from a distribution that has the true territory size as its mean and then we've got this notion of conditional independence and when we first described that we considered an analogy so let's say we're driving from Edmonton to Montreal and there's three ways to get from Edmonton to Saskatoon and three ways to get from Saskatoon to Toronto and three ways to get to from Toronto to Montreal so in total if we're interested in, in probabilities the number of probabilities we'd have to deal with would be 27 on the other hand once we're in Toronto the number of probabilities in terms of getting to Montreal is only three and so the whole idea is that once we're in Toronto in terms of getting to Montreal we can ignore how we got to Toronto or to put it in statistical terms the probability of getting from Toronto to Montreal the probability of taking any particular path to go from Toronto to Montreal is conditionally independent of the path that we used to get to Toronto so if we come back here and look at our hierarchy we can see how this conditional independence would play out so conditional upon a bird specific fecundity the number of observed offspring would be independent of the maximum fecundity the age the territory size or the habitat type and similarly conditional upon maximum fecundity the bird specific fecundity would be independent of the territory size and the habitat type so we've got this conditional independence and the reason that conditional dependence is important independence is important and I really don't understand the details but conceptually when run jags goes on its random walk having conditionally independent distributions will facilitate the computations so in summary one of the advantages of hierarchical models is that they can take really complicated systems and break them down into bite-sized coherent meaningful submodels through a process of factorization and these submodels are arranged in a hierarchy and they are conditionally independent so the second feature I want to talk about is that hierarchical Bayesian models can accommodate multiple sources of variation that can be partitioned into phenomenal, which in this case, since we're dealing with birds, is going to be biological and data processes. So let's begin by returning to our complex system and seeing that we have, in fact, four submodels with four distributions with four different variances that mean or slightly different things so first of all bird specific values of fecundity are deemed to have arisen as random draws from gamma distribution with this is its mean and this thing here sigma squared age is the variance so that's our first submodel and the second submodel says that the maximum fecundity of the bird arises as a random draw from a gamma distribution with this is the mean and this thing here as the variance and those are the phenomenal processes moving now to the data processes 
third submodel says that the observed number of offsprings arise as random draws from Poisson distribution with lambda i as the parameter. And remember with Poisson distribution, there's only a single parameter lambda, which is equal to both the mean and the variance. And finally, in our fourth submodel, the three replicate territory size observations are deemed to have arisen from random draw from a gamma distribution with this is mean, this is the variance. So, this is just a table that presents those four submodels. So, rich specific fecundities arise as random draws from a gamma distribution with a mean that's determined by the number of years since the bird began reproducing and the maximum fecundity of that bird and a variance that's given here. So let's think about that variance. What is the role of this variance? What is that variance doing? Well, it's quantifying the size of the effects of biological processes not in the model. So what the heck does that mean? What that means is that we've modeled fecundity as a, as a function of the age and the maximum fecundity of that bird. But there are other phenomenal processes. There are other phenomenal processes not captured by this simple model, or perhaps an oversimplified model, that affect the fecundity of the bird. And the whole idea of these variances is that they quantify the effect of those other phenomenal processes that are having an effect on the fecundity. And a similar thing is happening here with the second submodel that says that the maximum fecundity arises as a random draw from a gamma distribution with a mean that's determined by the territory size of the bird and the habitat type and once again this variance here captures the effect of other phenomenal processes that play into determining maximum fecundity that are not captured by our simplified model as subject matter experts it is really the stuff above the line that we're going to be primarily concerned with when it comes time to write up this paper I'm guessing our main focus is going to be on the posterior distribution of three important parameters. The first one is this, the rate at which fecundity declines with years once the bird begins to reproduce. This parameter here that reflects the rate at which maximum fecundity declines with territory size, and this parameter that reflects the effect of habitat type on maximum fecundity. So there's our main focus. But I think we ought to also be interested in these variances because they do have phenomenal implications. And as I said, they quantify the size of the effects of other factors other than those in our model that affect what ultimately we're going to be thinking about, we're ultimately thinking about bird fecundity. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw this line. And although it separates out the phenomenal from the data processes, the distinction isn't perhaps quite as black and white as I've drawn it here. However, I think there is a difference in that as subject matter experts, we're primarily concerned with the phenomenal processes, we're less concerned with the data processes, and these are primarily, in my mind, just statistical bookkeeping that we got to make to, to make sure that our analysis is appropriate. So let's think about the third submodel that says that the observed number of birds arises as a random draw from a Poisson distribution with a mean and variance that's equal to the fecundity of that bird. And to me, in essence, this isn't terribly different from what we saw in week one when we had three red and one white marble, and we drew five marbles with replacement from a sack, and we determined the probability of getting any one particular number of marbles. And, and what I'm saying is that, to me, there's precious little biology here. This is just a statistical thing that we're dealing with. Before moving on to, to model four, however, what I want to do is make it a brief digression and say that we're assuming that we know the number of birds that are actually being produced. But that may not be the case. So, for example, these folks examined 128 species and they determined that the probability of detection, in other words, the probability of seeing a bird if in fact it was present, only average 64%, and the range went from 3 to 99%. That presumably is a bit of a problem. But one of the nice things about hierarchical models is that they give us conceptually a way to deal with that problem. So what we're going to do is, here's, here's this thing here, and I've just reproduced it here, 
and we're simply going to add another layer to our hierarchy. So we're going to say, okay, the actual number of birds that arises is a random draw from a Poisson distribution where this is its mean, but then we're going to add a layer that says that the number of observed birds occurs as a random draw from a binomial distribution, which has as its mean the actual number of birds present, and this value here, which is the probability of detection. And these models are known as n mixture models, n because we're dealing with n number of birds, and mixture because we're dealing with a mixture of probability distributions. And then finally, our fourth submodel says that the three replicate observations of territory size occur as random draws from gamma distributions with a mean which is the true territory size and this variance. And it seems to me that there's a subtle distinction between these two things, even though both are related to observational error. Here we're dealing with observational error in the dependent variable, the thing that we're trying to predict. And here we're dealing with observational error in the independent variable a predictor. And those of you taking other statistics courses, you probably learned that in multiple linear regression or just basic linear regression, all the independent variables are assumed to be known without error. And this oftentimes is not likely to be the case. There are some mathematical techniques that are used to deal with it, but all too often I think that we just ignore it and pretend that it's not a big deal. The advantage of hierarchical Bayesian models is that we can explicitly deal with the fact of observational error in our independent variables. And the last thing I want to mention is that in addition to dealing with different types of observational error, hierarchical models are very flexible in that they enable us to work with different types of data. So for example, meta-analysis or model averaging. They can also be included in these data processes. And just reference here a paper by Ogle et al. that they took data from a hundred different studies, combined them, and made inferences about you know elevated CO2 or warming, but they're underrepresented in global change experiments. So in conclusion, to me, hierarchical models are really useful, they're really important, they're really valuable. Why? Well, first of all, they can take really complicated systems and break them down into bite-sized pieces, into submodels that have meaningful and relatively easily interpreted meanings. Also, it can accommodate multiple variances and partition those into phenomenal and data processes. And finally, they're really flexible. We see that in n-mixture models, in meta-analysis, model averaging, bottom line, where I see things, hierarchical models are really useful.